All right. <clears throat> First announcement. The most obvious one that's probably no news to anybody. Just reminding you guys that lab is due on Friday as usual. It's a completely online lab. You don't need to meet in person. So, you know, we didn't meet on Monday. We won't meet today. If you need me, though, let me know. It's a pretty simple one. But, um, yeah, if you need me, let me know, and I can either meet you online during the lab hours or uh, whenever else you need to meet, you know, if I can, if I can pull it off. So any questions about lab this week? All right, the next announcement, lab reports. So I know I've been saying it, but I keep, I was hinting for a while. I was saying, make sure you get your lab report in because I have no way of knowing when you get it in. So I said, once I start grading it, you know, that's, you know, I have no idea of knowing it if you got it in on time or if you just turned it in the night prior. Anyway, that time has passed, so I've started writing it. And I want to say, first of all, to remind you guys, you can still make corrections until I've given you a grade. And even then, you know, you could still technically make corrections. But anyway, I also want to point out, kind of in a rush to do it now because I've been dragging my feet for the reason I just mentioned. So don't feel bad if like your if your feedback's all negative. Like if in a perfect world I'd be like, good job on this, good job on that, but I don't have time for that. So it might be like, hey, what about this? What about that? It might seem like it's really negative, and I apologize for that. Don't think you did bad because of that. I mean, some of you did do bad, but don't think that just because you've got nothing but negative feedback that I'm trying to be mean or anything like that. I'm just in a rush. Um, so yeah, that's the thing about lab reports. So any question about lab reports? Good morning. All right. Grade sheets. Somebody sent me an email saying that they can't find the grade sheet. So every time I send out an announcement, it is included. You know, I know there's about a million and a half attachments, but if you look at the email and look at those attachments there, it is the grade sheet is on there. Another way you can look at it. Speaking of which, if you go here, so if you look at this announcement from April 14th, well, you don't even need to go back that far. This one, I don't know, April 18th, whatever. Right here, right under the tent, it says, see the spreadsheet to see which days you are marked absent or late. So you can click that. That's the grade spreadsheet. Anyway, if after this, you still don't know where to find a grade sheet, let me know. Meet me online during office hours and I will show you. I don't want to just send you the link because you'll probably just lose the link too because I've been giving it to you every day. So... And I don't want to teach, I don't want to give you a fish. I want to teach you to fish, if you know that old parable. Anyway, any questions about grade sheets? All right, final. The final exam will just be like it normally would be, like we would be having class. We'd be 8 a.m. on Monday, specifically Monday, May 9th. We will meet at 8 a.m. online, um, except instead of being from 8 to 9, 8 to 8.50, it'll be 8 to 9.50. So we'll have more time, which makes sense because it'll be 100 questions instead of 50. It'll be just as usual. It'll be online. And just as usual, if you want to take an in-person exam, let me know. Um, and as usual, if you want more time to take it, we need to make arrangements beforehand. So let me know. And if for some reason May 9th doesn't work for you when you want to take it a different time, let me know when we can make other arrangements. Um, obviously, if you're going to take it later, to be fair to your classmates, you're going to have to take a slightly harder version, you know, because you would have had slightly longer to study for it. So any questions about the final? All right. Class on Friday will be online again. This time it's out of my control. They're using this room for an event. So it was either move to another room or just do it online. So we're just going to do it online. So for that reason, obviously, when we're online, the attendance will be as it usually is online. Like just do the attendance keywords because I'm not going to force you to do questions when I'm forcing you to be online. So any questions about class on Friday? Whew. All right, that brings us to attendance. Today's attendance will be like usual. For you guys who, who are here, if you don't mind sending me an email just so I can have a paper trail, say that you were here. You guys will get extra credit for being here. Um, for those of you guys online, you'll just do the um, the keywords. If it's before, you know, make sure you get in the keywords before nine. And if you're watching this video, there will actually be questions. At least I plan on it, but we'll see. I may change my mind. If I post a video without questions, you know there's no questions. So any questions about attendance all right man that took longer than i thought and we were behind so speaking of attendance the first keyword for attendance today will be march like the thing you would do in boot camp or in marching band or even like the month march all right so that being said let's get started let's jump right into it we are running behind i have to hurry up as I said on Monday, if anything, if I'm going too fast, jot down a note and send me an email and meet me during office hours so I can go back to whatever concept it is that you need me to re-explain. 
So we got through the first half of this chapter, which is good. We talked about an overview of population ecology, talked about population growth models. So remember, population is just a group of the same species that are kind of interacting together. They're at the same place at the same time. So we'll talk about how they grow, how they interact, basically how they survive, right? What makes them thrive and die. So now that we're past that, we're talking about the applications of population ecology. It's like, what do we do with all this information? And this should be pretty quick and easy because throughout these first two bullet points, I've been kind of talking about the applications of population ecology because I don't like to just give you information and say, this is what it is. I like to tell you why this information is important. But anyway, let's get into it. Appulation, applications of population ecology. I can't speak today. So... Natural ecosystems have been converted to those that produce goods and services for our benefit. So that's when you think about, well, just anything, anything that's man-made, you should think, well, that's what that bullet point is. So farms, right? Anything that grows like wheat or corn or whatever it is else we eat, that would be a natural ecosystem that humans converted to specifically grow that one crop. That's just one example. I could give you more and maybe I will later, but for now, let's leave it at that. So with that being said, population ecology is used to increase the populations of organisms we wish to harvest. So again, if you are a corn farmer, then we're trying to increase the number, you know, the amount of corn that we can harvest on that 100 acres that you own or whatever it may be. At the same time, you also want to decrease the population of pests. So again, if you're a corn farmer, you want to get rid of weeds, right, that are taking up space and taking up nutrients. You want to get rid of certain insects that might be eating your crops. Um, and also population ecology, on a whole completely separate note, is used to save populations of organisms threatened with extinction. And I'm going to put this little dotted line here because generally speaking, like the first two kind of things go together. And a farm is a great example of those two things. But the third one's kind of uh, on its own. But of course, this all, all three have to deal with man-made ecosystems because, again, the reason so many organisms um, and species are going extinct is because of human activity. So, any questions about this slide? This is just the introduction to um, applications of population ecology. All right. The first thing we're going to talk about under applications of population ecology is the conservation of endangered species. This is a pretty simple topic. This is one of the few things that most people are indoctrinated with for their whole uh, life. This is not necessarily a new idea, but this example is a great example because... When most people, I think when most people think of endangered species, they just think of the simple thing, which is, hey, if they're endangered, don't kill them, right? And we won't need a whole class to talk about that. So what I'm going to do is give you an example of how population ecology is used to do this and why it's good to understand population ecology, because it's not sometimes as simple as, hey, they're endangered, don't kill them. So here's the example. And just know for the exam, this probably won't be on the exam because, you know, I don't like putting examples on the exams. Uh, but I think there are questions about this on the lab report. I mean, on the, on the study guide. So here we go. We're talking about a woodpecker, particularly a red cockaded woodpecker. That's the species. And it requires long leaf pine forest where it drills its holes into the pine trees. So it's a very specific habitat this thing requires, right? So it needs those particular long leaf pine forests. It's not going to do good in this... Um, hardwood forests of the Appalachians, for example, right? It needs to be in those specific forests. Um, the woodpecker numbers started to decline as the suitable habitat was lost. This makes sense. They're very picky. They need those, those forests. So as we started getting rid of those forests for the logging, right, or for agriculture because we needed that land to grow stuff, or here's the, here's the weird one, suppressing fires that are natural occurrences, right? So these two, I think, would make sense. We say that those woodpeckers need the forest. So as we remove the forest, we get rid of the woodpeckers, right? That makes sense. That part's common sense. But what about this? How is suppressing fires in that forest going to decline the number of um, these woodpeckers? Any guesses? Mm. I like what you said. But, but what I'm saying here is what happened is we started to suppress the fires and that's what killed the killed off the woodpeckers. So it's not like the fires were there when we started the fires. No, what we were doing was there used to be naturally occurring fires that just did their thing and we started putting them out. And then because of that, the woodpeckers started to decline. 
I know it's weird, right? And this is again why this is a great example of why population ecology is important because sometimes it's not common sense. Because common sense would tell me put out the fires because they need those forests. So we need the forest not to burn. But let's talk about it. Before we talk about why, I'll give you a little bit more information about these birds. The breeding birds abandon the nest when the vegetation is thick and higher than 15 feet. So what I mean by that is to try to picture in your mind, and I'll show you a picture of it later, but try to picture a forest with a bunch of pine trees. And, you know, sometimes you can see through the trees, right? And you can see like acres down, down the way. Sometimes it's just thick vegetation, vegetation and you can't see through the, the trees. What I'm saying here is this is a situation in which there is thick vegetation, so thick that it's over 15 feet high. So not only can you not see, but it's really high, right? And that's not good. Why? Because these birds require a clear flight path to get from tree to tree. Um, apparently that brush is, gets in the way and they're not good at it. Um, it's a critical habitat that's protected with a maintenance program that includes controlled fires to reduce the undergrowth. Um, so basically what we're saying here is the high underbrush is a bad thing, right? They still need the forest, but when you don't have the fire, the wildfires, then you get this thick underbrush and they can't live in the thick underbrush. So um, that kills them. So now what we do instead is we let the fires burn, or in some cases we actually have prescribed fire. So again, none of that's going to be on the, the exam, but it's a great example of how you have to understand, or not you, but somebody out there, some scientist needs to understand population ecology to be able to protect endangered species. Because somebody had to figure out, they had to figure out the life history of these birds, right? They had to figure out that, oh man, when there's thick underbrush, these birds just they're not there, right? So having thick underbrush would be the same as not having the forest as far as they're concerned. Make sense? So again, the idea here is you really have to understand a species, a population, to be able to protect it. It's not always just common sense. And I'll give you some more examples of that later. Um, the next word for attendance will be advisor. Like hopefully all of you have seen your advisor to either figure out graduation or apply for or excuse me, register for classes on the sun, uh, summer or the fall. Anyway, here's the pictures of what I've talked about. There's the woodpecker we're talking about. Here's what a healthy forest looks like that sees regular uh, fires. Here's what we're talking about, the thick underbrush. And again, I'm a, even, I'm a biologist, and to me, without had I not known this, this to me just looks healthier, right? It's green, it's bush, bushy. Like, to me, that looks healthier. But that's the, what the natural ecosystem is supposed to look like on the bottom. So again, it's not all common sense, which makes things a little bit difficult sometimes. So that's it for conservation of endangered species. Are there any questions about conservation of endangered species? All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is sustainable resource management. Um, before I even get into what this says here, really quickly, the word sustainable is an important concept or the concept of sustainability is important. What you're saying basically, and it gets a little bit more complicated than this, but you know, sustainability means it's you're doing something and you can continue to do it, right? So uh, we are catching fish right now at an unsustainable rate, for example, right? Eventually, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to basically run out of seafood, right? So we're catching more than being replaced by nature. That's one example of non-sustainability. Um, probably an opposite example of that. Again, going back to corn, right? We're really good at planting and uh, producing corn. So what we're doing there is sustainable at a, at a basic definition, but if we had more time, we could talk about why it's not sustainable, but we don't have time for that. Anyway, that being said, now we know what sustainability is. Um, according to the logistic growth, and let me remind you, we show, I showed you a graph and I said that there was two different types of growth. There was exponential growth where it shoots up like that and then eventually it starts leveling off when it hits carrying capacity and that's what we call logistic growth so according to logistic growth so this growth pattern right here um, the fastest growth occurs when the population is at one half the carrying capacity All right so here's zero here's carrying capacity up here so the sweet spot so to speak is right here All right so anything below this or above it and the population is not growing as quickly, right? It is at that point, the population is growing its quickest. Now, don't get me wrong. The population is obviously larger the higher you go. But I'm saying the growth rate, like the most it's putting out per generation, is right there in the middle. So that's the sweet spot. So theoretically, the best results are achieved by harvesting the population down to this level. 
So again, if you work for DNR or if you're in charge of DNR and you're trying to figure out, all right, how many deer should we have in this state? How many bass should we have in this river? You know, this is the sweet spot you're trying to figure out, which is complicated, right? Because first of all, you have to figure out what the carrying capacity is. Then you have to um, properly estimate what the actual population is. But anyway, if you could do it, then that's the spot you're looking for. That might be a test question. Um, it might, the test question might be, you know, I don't know how I'm going to word it, but basically, in better terms, I'll say, what's the sweet spot in the situation? And again, it's halfway between zero and carrying capacity. Um, but the tricky part is that the logistic growth model assumes that the growth rate and carrying capacity are stable over time, right? Because again, that's just a model. If you remember the actual graphs I showed you, it had that little red line, but then there were like little black dots that were kind of all over. But the black dots were the actual data, right? So it's not always perfectly like that. So again, that's what makes it tricky. Um, actually, and if you download this PowerPoint, you can click this video or click on this link and it'll show you a video of what I'm about to show you. But I'm about to give you an example of how, yes, this seems simple in theory, just hit the sweet spot and you're good to go. But what I'm about to do is give you an example of how it's not that easy. Uh, your book points out that fish are the only wild animal that are still hunted at the large scale. And I know that sounds weird because we use the term fishing. But when you think about it, fishing is hunting. You're going out there and you're catching a wild animal and killing it, right? Um, but anyway, because of that, they are very vulnerable to overharvesting. And your book gives a very specific of the North Atlantic cod fishery. So we're talking about, obviously, you guys know where the North Atlantic is. That's probably near, you know, New England, that area, uh, Maine, you know. Anyway, we're talking about this fishery where they're fishing for cod. What happened was that their estimations of the population was too high. So again, I'm going to draw this graph very quickly. E so, you know, oh, damn that line. Sorry for the for the language. So, you know, they thought maybe the population maybe was. So here's the sweet spot right here. Right. And they thought the population was higher than it was. So maybe they planned according to that. Right. Maybe they thought, all right, we have already at this. Bit. Um, maybe we already at the sweet spot. So because of that, they made some decisions that weren't exactly good. Um, and your book examples are they had a practice of discarding the young cod that were not legal age at sea. Um, which caused a higher mortality rate than predicted. So, sorry, I, I should make this a separate bullet point. So, for one thing, again, the first problem is one we just talked about. So, what I'm look, giving you here is multiple problems. The first problem they had was they, their population estimate was too high, right? So, because of that, they were missing the sweet spot to begin with. And they were saying, yeah, you can catch more than you want because they thought they had more than there were. The second problem was, you know, they were saying, all right, this, these are too young. You need to throw them back. Everything will be fine. Turns out that was a very vulnerable part of their life history, talking about what we talked about on Monday. So just throwing them back sometimes was just not that good enough. Um, so because of these problems and some other problems, the fishery collapsed in 1992 and it still hasn't recovered. So any questions about this? All right. I know a lot of you guys are on your phone. I hope you're paying attention. If you're not, that's okay. I get paid either way. But this is being recorded, and really this is on you. If you're not paying attention, maybe watch the video later because I'm going through it quickly because I have to. Anyway, there's a graph of what I'm talking about. The fishery collapsed in 1992, and it still hasn't recovered. I probably won't give you any questions about this on the exam, but if I do, it would be some basic fifth grade stuff where I show you this graph, and I might say, in what year was the highest population of this fish fishery? And you would look and like, okay, that's pretty high right there. You go all the way down and say, oh yeah, somewhere near 1970. Pretty simple stuff. Any questions about that? All right. Um, so sustainable catch rates can't be estimated without knowing life history trades. Again, that's what I was getting at earlier with that, that previous slide where I was saying that they were like, yeah, just throw away the, the cods that are at this age. And again, it turns out they didn't really have a good grasp of the life history. And again, to remind you what we said on Monday, when we talked about life history, one of the things we talked about was knowing when they're most vulnerable, right? We talked about, you know, going from this age to this age was a certain percentage of surviving and going from this age to that age was a certain percentage of surviving, percentage of surviving. So to know that, you truly need to know that to properly sustain a fishery. So like your book points out, population ecology alone is not sufficient. Um, sustainable fisheries require knowledge 
of community and ecosystem characteristics. And we don't even have time to get into that. But basically what this is saying is population ecology, even if they had known that, which they didn't perfectly, um, there's other stuff to consider. Like if you step it up a notch. So population, remember, is just that group of species that interact, excuse me, yeah, that group of individuals of the same species that interact. Um, community would be if you included all the other things. So instead of just these North Atlanta cod, that also includes the things that are eating it and the things that it eats and its parasites. And then if you were to go up even more, you'd look at ecosystem characteristics, which considers everything I just said, but also things that aren't alive, like um, the, the water temperatures at certain uh, temp uh, depths, uh, light characteristics, stuff like that. But we don't have time to get into it. Uh, you won't get tested on it. Are there any questions uh, from this slide? All right, if you download the PowerPoint, you click that fish, that's yet another short little video you can watch. Here's the fun one to me and the very easy one to understand. I think it's pretty straightforward. Invasive species. This is another one where a lot of people are already familiar with this. You probably already know a lot about invasive species. Um, so you, first of all, your book points out that organisms that are introduced to a non-native habitat have devastating effects on an ecosystem. And I put a little star next to that have because it's not always true. So if I were to take, I don't know, an alligator from my home state of Florida and drop it off in a river in Alaska, that would be an organism that was introduced to a non-native habitat, but it would not have a devastating effect on the ecosystem. Maybe for the little short time it was alive, it would probably kill a lot of fish or, you know, it would devastate that area, sure. But in the long term, that alligator is going to die pretty quickly, right? So it's not going to have that much harm. And I'll come back to that concept later. But anyway, that brings us to what an invasive species is. You need to know this for an exam. It is a non-native species that is spread far beyond its original point of introduction. And it causes environmental or economic damage by colonizing and dominating suitable habitat. In other words, it's a species that's not from, it is where it's not from and is doing damage. Right, so starling is, starlings are a good example of that that your book doesn't give. So some dude who really liked um, Shakespeare, he brought a bunch of birds, all the birds that were in Shakespeare books or stories, and he set them loose in New York. And the starlings happened to do really good in New York, those particular types of birds. And they spread far beyond New York, and they caused a lot of damage. And because of that, we consider them an invasive species. And again... Going back to my idea or my example of an alligator, if I were to bring an alligator and put it in a river in Alaska, that would not be an invasive species. That would be not where it's supposed to be, but it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to thrive. It's not going to cause any damage, basically. It's just going to die almost immediately. So wouldn't be considered invasive species. Any questions about that? What is? I think Spanish moss is actually from Florida, but I'd have to look into that. I didn't know if that, I don't think that's a basis, but I could be wrong. Um, kudzu is a big one in the South. Kudzu was definitely invasive, and they brought it in. As usual, some human brought it in thinking, oh, this would be good to help erosion. And if you've ever been to the South, especially like in North Georgia, Atlanta area, it's all over the place. Oh, yeah, and then these pictures. Hey, I'm so fascinated with the uh, invasive species. So let me write it if you guys don't know what these are. These are called Asian carps, and they're like Indiana area, I think, right now. Anyway, they're from Asia, but they're really bad in the Midwest. And this is what they look like. When you drive through the water, it spooks them, so they jump out, and it actually can be a problem. People get hit with them, like this dude right here. He got hit, but he's getting hit in the face with one. Some people try to have fun with it, so this guy's running protective gear because they really do hurt when you get whacked with them. And he's got a net to catch them, and he's dunking them in his little toy thing, his little toy hoop. It has a bucket at the bottom. But anyway, um, you don't need to know anything about Asian carbs. But to me, it's really interesting. And if you click any three of those pictures, you can see a short video of these Asian carps in action. And it is crazy, in my opinion. But anyway, any questions so far? All right. The next word for attendance is laser. Like, you know, something you would point. A little light. Um, so your book gives some numbers. In the U.S., there's hundreds of invasive species. And I think a lot of times when people think of invasive species, they usually think of animals. But I like that uh, Vance was asking about a plant, right? So sometimes it's not just animals. Sometimes it's plants. Sometimes it's, well, it's usually either plants or animals. But 
there are other things, but your book gets pretty specific. Mammals, birds, fishes, arthropods, mollusks. If you're still looking for extra credit, you could write independent work on it. I don't know. And your brain not, might not work like mine does, but for me, that's an interesting topic. Like I love to see which species are invasive. Like there are invasive species in West Virginia. Um, anyway, your book gets very specific. Um, and at the time that this was published, it was estimated that the uh, invasive species cost $137 billion a year in the U.S. I put it next to that because I'm not going to ask you that number. Like I already mentioned, not every species that introduced is successful. Therefore, it's not always invasive. Again, the example of an alligator in a river in Alaska is a great example of that because it would not be successful. Likewise, not everyone that survives becomes invasive. I wish I could give some more examples of that, of that but very rarely, sometimes, um, a, a species that's not from there comes in and kind of kind of fits and does a good job. Very rarely. Um, I think one of the videos I've shared with you or will share with you from that Hank with the crash courses, he talks about, he'll give some examples of where sometimes it was a good thing. Um, and then finally, your book points out that there is no single explanation of why a non-native species turns into a damaging pest, um, but invasive species typically exhibit opportunistic life history patterns. So any questions about this slide or invasive species in general? All right, we're in good pace here. Let's give some examples from your book. Cheatgrass, this is a plant example. Um, it's an invasive plant found in the arid Western United States, at least these are the areas that it has invaded. Um, it covers millions of acres that were formerly dominated by native grasses and sagebrush. And this is where it gets interesting to me. Think about this, because if you're not a biologist, and even me as a, as a biologist, if I didn't know a lot about this, to me, this wouldn't seem like a big deal. So there's one grass, something called cheat grass, some kind of plant that has taken over some area that was covered by plants, right? And if you don't know any better, you just think, okay, what's the problem? One plant for another, right? Um, so let's talk about why it's so successful. How did it like outcompete all the other native plants? One of the reasons is that it produces seeds earlier, right? So before the other seeds, other plants are even putting out their seeds to make new offspring, the cheatgrass has already done it. So it's taken up all the, the areas um, where the seeds can germinate. Also, not only does cheatgrass do it earlier, but it does it in greater abundance. So putting out the seeds earlier and putting out much more seeds. Um, also, it matures in the early summer. And remember, early summer means it's going to be very hot, right? So it becomes extremely dry and flammable, and that creates abundant fuel that is easily ignited by lightning or stray spark. Meaning, it's turned what used to be, you know, an area that would occasionally have a wildfire into an area that happens to have wildfires a lot. Um, and not only that, but cheatgrass fires are more intense because and also they're more frequent than fires that native plants have evolved to tolerate so again as we learn from that woodpecker um, example sometimes fires are necessary right because they're part of nature but if you have too few of them it's not good because things have evolved to have a certain amount of fire or in this case if you have too much fire it could be a bad thing because the plants that are native there were evolved to have a certain amount of fire so because of this, after a few fire cycles, the native plants were essentially completely gone. And there was over 150 species of birds and mammals that are now without food and shelter. So again, if you're not a biologist, you might look at that and say, big deal. We had a, a, an area full of grasses, but now we still have an area full of a particular type of grass. And if you don't know about population ecology, you wouldn't think anything of it. But it turns out, that by doing this, you really lost more than just the plants. Well, it's the plants themselves, that's a loss. But remember, it's a whole ecosystem, so those plants provide food for other, for, for animals. Um, and then those animals provide food for other animals. So because of that, you lose those native plants. And again, you lost over 150 species of birds and mammals. Um, to make things even worse, climate change have hastened the transition of rangeland to fields of cheatgrass. Why? because cheatgrass responds better to increase CO2 levels. So all plants need CO2 to grow, as we know from chapter six when we talked about photosynthesis, but it happens that cheatgrass is even better at it. So it's really good at absorbing that extra CO2, which is what we're getting, rising CO2 levels. Um, and because of that, it grows faster. Obviously it accumulates more tissue because remember, um, 
Photosynthesis makes G3P. That G3P is used to make glucose and cellulose and all that other stuff that you make plants out of. And because of that, it becomes more fuel for the fire. So as climate change gets worse and worse, these fires will get worse and worse for the reasons just listed. Um, and of course, put a big old X to this as a reminder that this is just an exam, it's an example, so we will not be on the exam. Any questions about this? All right, there's a picture of cheatgrass. So again, like to me, if you're like me, you're just walking through wherever there in Western United States and I've never been there and I was saying, oh, that's pretty grass, right? I wouldn't know any better unless someone told me, like, hey, this grass isn't supposed to be here and it's actually devastating our ecosystem. So let's give it um, a plant example, the Bur Burmese python. So this is my neck of the woods. This is where I started high school, South Florida. So what happens was people had these Burmese pythons, which are not from Florida, and people had them as pets and they thought, oh, I don't want this as a pet anymore. What am I going to do? I'm going to turn it loose in the Everglades. I bet they'll do good there. And they were right. They did very good in the Everglades. They're very abundant now in the Everglades because they eat native species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. So all these animals that are native to the, um, to the Everglades are not evolved to evade Burmese pythons. Now, granted, they're not completely dumb. It's not like a, bird's gonna, a native bird's going to see a snake coming and be like, oh, what is that? I've never seen a snake before. So it's not completely like that. But there are some nuances that we don't have time to get into. But yes, these things are not evolved to evade that predator. Likewise, pythons have natural predators where they're from, but they don't have them in the Everglades. So right in South Florida, this thing has plenty of things to eat. It has no diseases. It has no, um, no predators. So because of that, they're thriving, which is good for the python, but it's bad for the ecosystem. So any questions about the Burmese pythons? Again, just an example. So we'll not be on the exam. All right. And again, I don't know, really fascinating stuff to me. There you go. Yeah. If you click on that picture of the snake, like you've downloaded the PowerPoint and click that picture, it is a little quick news story about how they brought in snake, snake uh, hunters, if you will, I guess, from India. And, they, and these people are out here working in the Everglades trying to get rid of these pythons. There's all kinds of invasive species in Florida. Iguanas aren't supposed to be there. Yeah, pigs are really bad in the South. Pigs are not native to the United States at all. Anyway, so are there any questions about invasive species? All right, let's talk about biological control of pests because very often that is one of the ways people try to combat invasive species. And as you're about to learn, it does not always work the way we want it to. Um, I kind of hinted at this at the previous slide, but invasive species benefit from the absence of pathogens, right? So the, there's diseases and bacteria and viruses that get them, if you will, where they're from. But when you put them in a new place, those bacteria, those diseases, those viruses might not be there. So that's one of the reasons they thrive. Another reason, like I mentioned earlier about that Burmese python, there are no natural predators very often. Or if it's a plant... There are no natural herbivores in the new place. And again, this is why the, um, the invasive species usually thrive. Basically because the things that used to get them, so to speak, where they're in their homeland, they're not there anymore. So that brings us to this, term, this uh, concept of biological control, which you need to know for the exam. That is the release of a natural enemy to attack a pest population. In this case, we're saying it in the context of invasive species. So what we're saying here, like the story here is, all right, we have an invasive species. It doesn't have these things to get them from where they did at home. So we're going to bring in the things that used to get them from home. But just to be clear, this is how your book presented it, and it is proper. But I did want to point out that it's not always biological control, it's not always trying to go after invasive species. In this case, that is the story. But sometimes, as your book naturally pointed out, it's to an attack of pest population. So it doesn't have to be an invasive pest. It could be a native pest. The idea here is you're releasing natural enemies. So if you get a question on the exam and says, says something like, you're a farmer, you spray some pesticides to get rid of, I don't know, uh, the bugs that eat your corn. What is this an example of? Well, it's not an example of biological control, right? Pesticides are not natural enemies. Now, if I were to say you're a farmer, you have these bugs that are eating your corn, 
So you release a bunch of birds that eat those bugs. What is that an example of? That would be biological control. Then your book gets very specific, and I'm not going to ask you this on the exam, but biological control is used to control insects. Obviously, I just gave that as an example, but also weeds and other organisms that reduce crop yields. Um, one example that your book doesn't going to give, I'll just say it very quickly because he brought it up sort of earlier. Kudzu, um, that's an invasive plant from the south or in the south. It's taking over. So one of the natural things that they're using are goats, because goats will eat just about anything. So they're kind of using goats to, uh, to combat the kudzu. And that would be a biological control. Anyway, any questions about this slide? I think I'm going to give you, I think the next slide is an example of biological control. Mm -hmm. I have two examples. The first one will be an example of when it worked. Like, hey, biological control, great job. You did, you did it. And then the example after this will be when it failed. Anyway, St. John's wort. That's the example. That is an invasive species. It is a long-lived European weed that has invaded the western United States. Here we go again with the western United States. It has overgrown millions of acres of rangeland and pasture. And it has left few edible plants for graving livestock. So, again... If you're not a biologist, you might just think, okay, big deal. You've got one plant, now you have another. It's not that simple. In this case, um, St. John's wort cannot be eaten by livestock. So if you had this big rangeland for all your, your cows, they're going to be sold for meat. Well, they don't have anything to eat anymore. Anyway, so I'll, basically this bullet point saying, hey, it's an invasive species. It was a problem. So somebody had to do something about it. What did they do about it? Researchers imported leaf beetles from its native region. Because again, like we said, sometimes an invasive species doesn't have any natural things that are trying to get it, the best way to put it. Um, in this case, it didn't have any natural herbivores, so it brought in some herbivores. Like, oh, you're from Europe? Let me introduce you, reintroduce you to some European beetles that like to eat you. And they did, and it worked. And it reduced the weeds to about less than 5% um, of, the, of where they started, and that restored the land's value. So again, just an example of how sometimes biological controls do a good job of combating invasive species. And of course, I put a big X through this as a reminder to anybody watching this that that's just an example it will not be on the exam. It might be on the study guide, but it won't be on the exam. Any questions about St. John's wort? All right, and before I go to the next example, again, I'll remind you, in my opinion, this will be I don't want to say fun. It's hardly ever fun to write about stuff, but it's a relatively fun thing to write about maybe for independent work, for extra credit. If you want to look up some examples of biological control that has worked or like this one, biological control that's failed. This particular example is the Indian mongoose. Um, that itself was not the invasive species. That was the biological control. What we used it for was rats. Rats are a huge invasive species. Humans have been horrible about putting rats all over the place. Anyway, rats are bad. Rats were eating um, sugar cane, right, and other crops, which is a bad thing. So people thought, well, that's not good. Let's bring in some things that will eat this invasive species, these rats. And they did. They brought in the Indian mongooses because they're really good at eating rats. But what happened was not only um, did they do their job where they brought them in, but they also escaped. So they escaped the cane fields and also went to other natural habitats in the Caribbean and the Hawaiian Islands and wherever they were planting sugarcane. And because of that, the Indian mongooses became invasive themselves. So not only did they eat all the rats like they were supposed to, that part was good, but they started eating populations of reptiles, amphibians, um, and birds. So all those, all those native populations declined as the mongoose population grew and spread. So again, just an example of how biological control doesn't always work. Of course, you could say it worked because it did get rid of the rats. But then there was an unintended consequence of, well, now you've you've got you've your biological control itself turned into an invasive species. And again, a big X through there as a reminder that that will not be on the exam. Any questions about the Indian mongoose? All right, there it is. A sneaky little jerk. That's a bird egg. Obviously, it's not a rat egg, right? Because rats don't lay eggs. And it knows it's about to do something bad. It's going to eat that bird, that native bird egg. Oh, yeah. There's a, an example. Anyway, 
Every chapter has the process of science. I'll skip it like I always do, but there's the invasive plant I was telling you about. You can read all about it, kudzu. It's actually slowly and um, creeping up into West Virginia. But yeah, that's what it looks like. Like it's taking over everything. Anyway, read it if you want. Ask me questions if you have them after you read it. There will be no questions about it on the exam. And that brings us to integrated pest management. So the book points out that agricultural operations create their own highly managed ecosystems, which is a textbook way of saying, and you can almost say um, farms are very specific, right? That's sort of the same thing, you know, because usually it's like, like on large scales, like I grow corn or I grow soybeans. Right? They're usually, or I grow wheat. They're very specific. That's what we mean by highly managed ecosystems. Also, they have genetically similar individuals, i.e. a monoculture. Meaning, like when you're growing a bunch of wheat, you probably have essentially the same breed of wheat, um, which has its advantages, but also has its disadvantages. And we'll talk about the disadvantages as we go on. They're also planted in close proximity to each other. Like if you've ever seen any garden, like any big scale farm where they have rows of corn or rows of wheat or soy or whatever it is. It's not like that in nature, right? In nature, it's a bunch of different types of plants dispersed all over the place. It's never just like rows and rows and rows of one particular type of plant all close together. Um, so anyway, because of these two bullet points right here, farms or agriculture, basically agricultural operations, they function as a banquet for plant eating animals and pathogenic bacteria and viruses and fungi. So in other words, and again, I'm just going to stick with corn because I've been using it as an example. If you are an herbivore that eats corn plants, or if you are um, a bacteria that preys on corn plants, or you're a virus or a fungi that prey, preys on corn plants, in nature, you might be a little bit out of luck. There might be a corn plant here, there might be a corn plant there, but if you're going to, you know, a field with hundreds of acres of corn, You've hit the smorgasbord, right? There's nothing but corn everywhere. Anyway, any questions about this slide? This is still an introduction into integra integrated pest management. Haven't quite got into the good stuff yet or the important stuff. All right. So like invasive species, most crop pests have opportunistic life history patterns that enables them to rapidly take advantage of a favorable habitat. It's not going to be on the exam, just kind of an introduction to uh, give you a better idea of how crop pests work. Um, the history of agriculture has a lot of examples of this. And your book gives the examples of boll weevils. Again, I'm from the South, so I've heard of boll weevils. This is a common thing. And again, I, I lived in Georgia for a while. It's really a big thing in Georgia. But anyway, the boll weevil is an insect that feeds on the cotton plants as a larva and as an adult, which you might not know that that is, uh, I don't say rare, but sort of rare is, you know, insects have different life stages. And a lot of times, depending on what life stage they're in, they eat different things. But in this case, the bull weevil, it's all about the cotton plant, no matter what the life stage. Um, and it's unstoppable spread, severely damaged the local economies and had a long lasting impact on the region. And it really did. And if you're into politics or history, you could read into that. And it's interesting to see how a pest uh, messed up the cotton industry, which messed up or which changed the political scene. But we don't have time to get into it. And I put it next to it because it's just an example. So that won't be on the exam. So far, nothing about integrated pest management that I've talked about will be on the exam yet. This is still an introduction into integrated pest management. Any questions so far? All right. The next word for attendance, I'll just write it right here on the, on the top of the page because I'm not going to say it as I do sometimes. There you go. There's the next word for attendance. Right there on top of that picture of the bull weevil, the adult version of the bull weevil, eating the cotton plant. Anyway, let me move forward. So now we're really getting into pe integrated pest management. We're starting to get a little bit closer to the whole point of this main bullet point. Um, integrated best pest management is not just pesticides, right? Because pesticides themselves, they're good, but they have some issues. So let's talk about it. Pesticides may result in populations that are not affected by pesticides. We learned about that in natural selection, right? If you spray the field with pesticides, you're going to kill most of the most of whatever it is you're after. But some of them might have something genetically about them that makes them resistant to it. And if they survive and then they reproduce, 
then the next population, the next generation is going to be filled with pests that are naturally resistant to it. So yeah, pesticides, basically that bullet point says, don't always work because of natural selection. Another bad thing about pesticides is they may kill the pest and they're natural predators. All right, so you might, yeah, you might kill the certain herbivore, but you might also be killing the other insect that eats that herbivore, right? So yeah, that's half good because you're killing what you're after, but on the other end, on the other hand, you're also killing the things that you're trying to kill. You're killing the things that kill what you're trying to kill, excuse me. So as you can imagine, that might be bad. Um, and another important thing, pesticides may kill the pollinators. So I don't know how much you guys know about plants or pollination or how, you know, um, fruit works or food in general. You can't have it without pollinators. So you need things like bees, um, certain bats, certain birds, butterflies, things like that. You need them to go from flower to flower and pollinate. Without pollination, you don't have food. Um, so basically, this main pull-up point here is saying, hey, I know what you're thinking. Let's get rid of the pests. Let's get rid of pests. Let's use pesticides. But the point here is sometimes pesticides in themselves are not good enough. Finally, that brings us to the point of all this, which is this right here. Integrated Pest Management, um, abbreviated as IPM. It uses a combination of things we've already talked about. So first of all, it uses biological control. So we've already talked about biological control. It also does use some chemical control, which is what we just got finished talking about, the pesticides. And it uses cultural methods. And I'll come back to that. So it's a combination of three. That's what we mean by integrated pest management. So it's not just pesticide. It's not just biological control. It's not just cultural methods. It's a, it's a mixture of these three things. And before I get into cultural methods, does anybody want to guess what that means? What in the world might cultural methods mean if we're talking about pest management? That's okay. Um, this is what we're talking about. It's talking about when we say cultural methods, I'm talking about not only like what are you doing, but what do you allow, right? So that's basically what this bullet point is here. Integrated pest management advocates for tolerating a low level of pests and not total eradication. So that's a cultural method. So instead of everybody saying, all right, let's kill all the pests, it's saying, you know what, do what you can, but allow a low level of them. Um, it also advocates lowering the carrying capacity for pests. How? Well, there's a few ways. You could um, use pest resistant varieties of crops. So it's like, all right, you know, there's something called BT corn, and I don't have time to get into it, but that's a certain type of corn that's nat naturally uh, resistant to certain pests. Um, you could also use mixed species of plantings. That might not seem like, con that might not be like obvious to you, but a lot of pests are very specific. So there might be certain pests that'll eat corn, that won't eat potatoes, and then those things, <laughs> that won't eat tomatoes, and those things won't eat soy, whatever it is. So if you, instead of just doing all corn, if you have a mixed species, well, then you don't have a big smorgasbord, right? You have, if you're a corn herbivore, then now all of a sudden you have all these other things too that you can't eat. Um, likewise, um, another version of mixed species planting would also be crop rotation. So this year you're growing soy. Next year you're growing corn. The, the, the year after that you're growing wheat. So anyway, just an example. Um, again, if you need to know anything about IPM, for the exam, just know that it's not just biological control, it's not just chemical control, but it's also these cultural uh, changes. Um, but again, your book points out one more time that the biological control is used when possible. And even though we've already given you examples of biological control, your book does it again, specifically um, talking about IPM. And the example they use are, um, I'll just show you ladybug, ladybird beetles. That's what they call them, ladybugs. Ladybugs eat aphids, so, and they're also not harmful to crops. So it's like, hey, you have an aphid problem, put out some ladybugs. Um, that's just an example. It will not, won't be on the exam. Any questions about integrated pest management? All right, let's jump into the human population growth. Hopefully we can get a good solid introduction into this. And then on Friday, we can finish this. And then on chapter, next week, we can knock out chapter 20. And we'll be on schedule. Human population growth. This is a very, very, very relevant topic for you guys. Because it is an issue. 
I don't want to use the word problem. I don't have time to talk about why I don't like to use the word problem, but it is an issue worth considering. Your book says that in the few seconds it takes me to read this sentence, approximately 21 people will be born somewhere in the world and nine will die. Right? 21 born, nine will die. Really quick, looking at those numbers, is the population growing, shrinking, or staying the same? Right? It's growing. Right? 21 people were born, only nine died, right? So it's growing. Anyway. The cause of population growth or decline is an imbalance between births and deaths. This is common sense, right? You know this. The only way the population stays the same is if you have the same number of people or things being born as dying, right? So whenever there's anything, whenever there's more births than deaths, the population grows. Whenever there's more deaths than births, the population declines. Common sense stuff. You know this. Um, the human population is expected to continue increasing for at least the never, next several decades. Um, here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. So we know, unless something goes wrong, like a nuclear war with, with um, Russia combined with a new strain of COVID or something, I don't know. But it, the way things are projected, we do expect our human population to keep increasing for the next several decades. Um, but despite that, the number of people that have been added to the population each year have actually been declining since the 1980s. So basically what we're saying is there's, there's always been this gap, not always, but we've had this gap, more people being born than dying. That gap's been there for a while. And it's still there, right? Because we just said this is, the current, this is the current ratio, about 21 people being born for every nine people dying. However, that number keeps getting smaller and smaller and the ratio is getting closer and closer to where we're almost at that even number. Um, if you download the PowerPoint and click that um, link, you can find the video to watch about it. The last, there's a, uh, we'll come back to that on Friday, but the last word for attendance is report. I'll be online for office hours if anybody needs me. Those you two that came in late, make sure you email me to remind me that you came in late. You three, make sure you email me, remind me that you got here on time. You guys online, make sure you send me your attendance words before uh, 9 a.m. Whew. That was a sprint. Yep. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. That way I can have a paper trail.